Lanny Houston is the owner and agronomist of Down to Earth Consulting. Uh, prior to that, he was a sales and crop consultant with Nutrient Ag Solution, and he has spent his career consulting with farmers, helping them make sound agronomic decisions. Lanny also is and has been involved with many boards and committees, lending his experience and expertise to entities like the Colorado Department Ag Groundwater Commission, the South Platte Ag Nutrient Committee, and is president-elect of the Independent Ag Agriculture Consultants of Colorado, to name a few. So, Lanny, thank you so much for joining us here today, and I'll give you the stage or the screen, so be it. Oh, great. Yeah. All right. So, with that being uh, said, today I'd, uh, I'd like to touch the highlights with uh, uh, the polyflora uh, killer, otherwise known as the, uh, the PFAS um, or the PFAS. Um, and also, then I want to touch a little bit about the uh, Protect Americans' Children from Toxic Pesticide Act, which is called the PACTPA, which is a very long one on that one. So, um, with that, um, the ones I've got right here um, for the information I am presenting today was sent to me by the Colorado Department of Agriculture. In addition, the information I was found on the EPA website. Um, get into this one here. Um, strong carbon flowing uh, binds is what the EPA test uh, takes action, I should say, is um, investigates the PFAS contamination due to their strong carbon flowing bonds. Many PFAS can be uh, very present in environment and degradation of periods of years of decades or longer. Uh, the PASF in the environment can lead to adverse human health effects. Um, and then also the exposure part of it. Um, there, are, there are a variety of ways that people can be exposed to these chemicals and at the different levels of exposure, for example, people can be exposed to low levels of PAFS and through food, which can uh, become contaminated through uh, contaminated soils and water used to grow the food or food packaging containing um, the PFAs or equipment that is used to PFAs during food processing. Um, the health effects on this one here is uh, the PA states uh, there is evidence that exposure to the PGAs can lead to adverse health outcomes in humans. If humans or animals ingest PFAs uh, by eating or drinking food or water that contaminate PFAs, the PFAs um, are abundant and can accumulate in the body. Um, the PFAs stay in the human body for a long period of time. As a result, as people get exposed to PAGs for different sources over time, that the, the level of PGAs in their bodies may increase to the point where they suffer from adverse health effects. Um, some studies indicate the PFOA and the PGOS can cause uh, reproductive and developmental liver and kidney and, and immune system affected by in laboratory animals. Both chemicals have caused tumors and animal studies. The most consistent finding for human uh, studies are increased uh, cholesterol levels among exposed populations with more limiting findings related to A, infant birth weights, um, effective on immune system, cancer, um, and thyroid hormone disruption. Right. In 2006, um, here's the history of the PFAS. In 2006, EPA changed container rules due to leaking steel drums. Container manufacturers turned to the process to meet the container standards. In 2020, environmental groups began sampling the environment around the New England states region and identified the PFAS contamination. Um, that launched uh, EPA initial an invest investigation um, as of January 14th, 2021. EPA administrated that it discovered unspecific levels of nine different PFAS in shipping and shipping barrels and Advil 10 plus 10, a pesticide that was used in aerial spraying programs in Massachusetts, Florida, New York, and estimated 25 other states, including Colorado. Um, 
onto the EPA investigating part of it, um, found to be a container issue, not a formulated pesticide. So the PFAS, PFAS leaching into the pesticide levels detected in parts per million. So essentially it's not the, the insecticide or the pesticide is that's causing the toxics. It's the product that's used to make it almost waterproof. It's leaching into the pesticide and then it gets applied. Uh, through a ground rig or airplane. Uh, hence, that's what it did with the Anvil 10 by 10. Um, uh, permit program has already been looked into for that one. And if this comes to a head, they're thinking estimate is about 30% of the agricultural chemical or packaging um, may have this um, in it. And so that makes it a much bigger issue if that continues to go that high. Um, also, EPA will uh, investigate other container manufacturers process. EPA may identify other pesticide products that may be affected in its ongoing investigation. So with that being said, they're going to go a lot deeper into it. And hopefully we don't have a whole gamut of different ones that we have to be looking at. Um, but there's more to come on this. So this is, you know, this hasn't been uh, here for very long. So it's kind of on a new uh, tip of it. So I guess what I'm wanting to bring is, is if you do hear anything about it, uh, at least you're kind of aware of it. Also, uh, you know, as of right now on the retail side of it and that, uh, talk about Bear and Monsanto's, we haven't had any, uh, you know, uh, indication yet that it's uh, affected the um, distributing of the products or with the containers until they do a little bit more investigating on it. So um, as it says there, more to come. Okay. Um, with that then, I um, wanted to talk a little bit about the Protect America's Children from Toxic Pesticide Act. This was introduced on August 4th, 2020. Um, the last action on it was September 11, 2020. Um, it was referred to the Subcommittee of the Biochemistry and Horticultural and Research. Um, so that's kind of where it's sitting right now. Um, with this act, this, this bill was introduced by Senator Udall. And as you can see here, all the sponsors introduced the bill to the House. Um, this bill will repeat pesticide preemption nationwide, affecting pesticide registration and use in general. Um, if passed, it could mean that the very, uh, for every city, parish, county, or town could have different rules and regulations of pesticides. So essentially they can't be less restricted than the EPA, but they can always make it more. Um, so with that, um, designated dangerous pesticides. This bill would allow citizen petitions to designate pesticides as dangerous. Um, dangerous is defined as a pesticide that are at any of the following. Carcinic, acute, um, uh, cause harm of pregnant women and fetus or cause neurological or development harm. Um, EPA administrator must review the potential within 90 days. If the administrator does not respond in 90 days, then the pesticide is automatically classified as dangerous. Um, if the pesticide is deemed dangerous, then the administrator must suspend registration. If the administration does not suspend it within 60 days of, of decision, then the registration is immediately canceled. So uh, essentially we have about 60 days in there, we can lose the, the whole ball of wax on that one if this comes to, to a head on this one. Um, also, um, the citizen suits. This bill allows citizen suits against administrator for failure to comply with any of these provisions. This means that any chemical denied dangerous chemical may likely result in a lawsuit. Um, so essentially, if it does, um, yeah, essentially, if it does get denied and, and does not get on the dangerous, then it pretty much opens up the, the applicator for uh, likely results in lawsuits. Um, emergency review of pesticide banned in other countries. Um, this is a big one also. Any pesticides banned or su suspended in the EU or Canada shall be immediately suspended in the United States. Uh, this would cover approximately one third of all registered pesticides as it stands today. The only factors that can be considered are epidemiological data peer review literature and data generated by the US or foreign governments or agencies. 
economic data, alternative products available are not considered. Um, let's see what else we got here. Then um, moving on onto the also the nicotinoid ban. All nicotinoids register, registrations would be canceled immediately, um, which is a lot of the seed treatment we've got out there. Um, all organophosphate pesticide registers would be immediately canceled and uh, no new registrations allowed. So we would actually lose the organophosphates forever. Um, the counters, the, the rootworm materials um, is, is a huge one on that one. Uh, we're, we're narrowed down as that is already. Another one is paraquat registrations immediately canceled and no new registrations allowed. Um, paraquats become quite more, uh, has been, has been used a lot more in the last four or five years, being as we've had Roundup resistant weeds pop up into the area, especially on the, in the fallow market or burn down market. Um, and so that I know the last couple of years that Syngenta has done a lot of money spent into it to, to read the, do the jugs and make it more um, user safe. Um, but uh, it is also on the chopping block automatically on that one. And uh, all inert ingredients must be uh, published um, labels mandated in English and Spanish, as well as any other languages where more than 500 individuals speaking said language are known to use a product. Emergency use exemptions may only be granted once in 10 years per product. So that drains that out pretty far. Um, and I have a feeling the labels are going to be huge by the time they do that. So with that, um, I guess, is there any question on those two things that I could try to answer? Like I said, I don't know them backwards or forwards, but I could try to, or at least get some answers for you on that one before I go on the product update. Any questions for Lanny? You can always pop them up in the chat or raise your hand and we'll try and get you uh, put up so you can ask a question live. Um, one thing I was thinking, Lanny, as you mentioned, uh, you know, those, um, uh, pia, uh, those, those chemicals leaching into the, into that, you know, how much is that going to impact with 30%? How quickly can that, that container be changed so that our producers aren't impacted by, uh, just the container, uh, for the pesticides and, that they need? Yeah, good question. Good question. I mean, that you know, I was talking with suppliers right now, and, and the biggest fear is now there, there's already a plastic shortage. Um, and so, you know, if this turns around and, and, and the EPA comes and demands it, um, it's, it's going to take a sure, it's going to take some time to turn it around to find suppliers. And then, of course, the expense of it. I mean, this was designed because it was supposed to be a the, the cure all of leaks, which it has done that, but. Uh, um, over so many years of doing it, plus it lasts forever in the soil. So um, I don't know how much more they're going to have to go and research to check for a new base, a plastic base, to make sure then also it's resistant to the chemicals. So this could be a big, uh, a big blow if it comes down to it. And then also too, um, what kind of scares me is the recycling or how we're going to, I guess, um, uh, find ways to go ahead and recycle or to destroy uh, the old jugs is is another thing that uh, would be uh, uh, another thing that would probably slow down the process. Um, you know, at that point in time, if, if it's labeled as a hazardous, then what does that mean for the shuttles or the jugs that you have on hand? So it's yet to be seen on that one. Hopefully they'll tear it out, but uh, we just never know, you know how fast these things go. Great. And, and we have a question from our own Kim Redden here at Colorado Corn, our Director of Market Development and Public Policy. Uh, she asked, what can producers do to ensure that they have these products in their toolbox? And so I'm assuming that that would, uh, that would encompass both of the topics you touched on, uh, the leaching of plastics, as well as this uh, piece of legislation that you discussed. Yeah, I mean, on that part of it, with the, coming into just talking with John Scott, you know, with the, the very beginning of it, I mean, anytime we can stay active to try to uh, lessen this here, um, especially on the plastic, um, you know, I, I, I guess at this point in time, I would probably, until they come out with what uh, manufacturers or what they're seriously looking into, because I honestly don't know. Um, other than that one product uh, that had it in it. Um, that's what they're going to investigate to see once what other products um, 
containers that had that in it, but I would definitely probably keep it on the clean side of your, any open containers, any old containers right now, just to try to keep it uh, on the clean side of it. On the other for the, uh, for the uh, protecting of the children, um, that one there would just need to be a little bit more vocal. We need to make sure um, that is a disaster. Um, if, if this does come through that, you know, with the EPA's regulations and then each state and city um, and county can go ahead and add to whatever they want to on top of it, essentially make a uh, maybe not a restricted use into a restricted use. Um, that is very uh, uh, concerning to me and should be to everybody because there's a lot of people at that point in time making decisions um, that do not know anything about the product that they're wanting to regulate. Um, and so um, we're, we're having problems as it is with products trying to fight with diseases out there with uh, the pesticides. And we are, you know, we are trained professionals. It's just that we've got to make sure that we all stick in there and let those people know that uh, you know, we use these pesticides only, only if we have to, not just because it's there. I don't see any other questions, Lanny, if you want to, uh, is there anything else that you were going to touch on? Yeah, I just want to touch on real quick um, here what we've got for uh, a product update is kind of, and I'm sure everybody's hearing on the, on the members out there about the fertilizer pricing going up, just kind of want to maybe address that, that elephant in the room a little bit here. Um, you know, when we go into the, to the nitrogen, um, the nitrogen has is, is crept up pretty quick since this fall. Um, you know, part of it is, you know, some of our factories or manufacturers are old. Um, they, they break down quite a bit with the regulations that are out there. Um, really, nobody wants to go ahead and spend any money on, on uh, bringing in a new, new plant um, when they can go ahead and go overseas and be able to do it a lot cheaper over there. Um, another thing is, too, is the, the commodity prices, of course, is driving up the, the prices of, of fertilizer. Um, Another thing is too on nitrogen. There was a, there was a lack of uh, anhydrous put on in, in the corn belt. So that's gonna put a big pressure on nitrogen um, when it comes to the spring. Um, so distributing um, that kind of stuff. So they're, they're predicting that, uh, you know, there's gonna be some, some rough roads coming here to supply the nitrogen just because of the sheer amount. So, uh, you know, that, that's kind of standard with the nitrogen part of it. Um, now the phosphorus, um, you know, there's been quite a few things on the phosphorus market. Uh, there's been an antitrust here with foreign countries. Um, a lot of rumors are saying that Russia was subsidizing their, their producers with the phosphate. Uh, so a lot of the, the phosphorus producers here in the United States went ahead and, and cut uh, production and, and stuff uh, in protest of that. And I think they took them to court and I think that just got done a couple weeks ago. But with that being said, um, you know, cutting back production for six to eight months has really uh, kind of put things in behind, um, and especially on 1152. Um, on the 1034 oil side of things, phos acid is going to be short. And so if you have shortages of phos acid and hydrous, that's the two major ingredients on that. So um, between that, the truck shortage and, and the COVID with places getting shut down, uh, phos the, the phosphorus market is is the one that um, is is a touch and go uh, as of right now. So you know I always tell the growers like right now um, most of my growers you know after taking the soil test and that type of stuff where we can band on phosphorus you know now I would suggest that phosphorus just to to really manage the the product for right now between the cost and also availability. I would make sure that um, um, the guy really make, take, pull soil test and, and, and fertilize for what your crop needs for the year, not so much a, a soil building year right now. Um, on the chemical side of things, uh, there'd be a few things been same way been affected on that. Um, you know, the dock worker strike kind of kind of messed some things up over there. There was a lot of ships that had tech. Um, again, with the, the way the United States is right now of, of having such strong regulatory stuff. There's a lot of the techs that are made in other countries brought over here to, to be finished uh, making it up. So with that, um, you know, anytime we have a strike over there, um, if we have COVID, if somebody shuts down, it affects that the storm down in Texas, when they had shut down quite a few of the manufacturers because of the cold, because 
again, without the heat, that's going to affect some of the COVID and BASF products. Not to say everything is short, but this just some of the things that are out there. Um, also, China had a lot of flooding also. So um, that puts a lot of, like I said, tech product comes from China, such as a lot of the main ingredients of Roundup right now has come over there. And there's still a lot of ships out in the ocean that uh, um, have it on there. It's just uh, they can't get it unloaded. Uh, and then also uh, the freight is getting higher. And again, with the shortage of truck drivers and that uh, always puts, it's kind of the perfect storm this year on that part of it also. So other than that, I think that's pretty much all I've got right now. If there's any other questions on the products. That, that was a great update. You packed a lot of information in. I'm going to launch one last poll before we go to our break. The question is a true false. In Colorado, 85% of the corn consumed is by livestock. So go ahead, throw your answers up there before we go to the break. And happy to take any questions for Lanny before we go to that break on what he's presented, whether it be the containers, the legislation, or fertilizer that we've, we've heard of. Um, you know, great advice there, Lanny, kind of looking at, you know, the future of that. Uh, with the, you mentioned that in the Midwest, they didn't put on a lot of anhydrous. Was that because of uh, weather issues or is that because of some of the uh, environmental and water quality issues that they're dealing with in the Midwest now? You know, some of it is parts. It depends on what parts you're in with, uh, you know, the groundwater, um, uh, the leaching, that type of stuff is getting more and more scrutinized. Um, and also, too, with just uh, some places were really, really uh, dry, it's too dry to put on uh, in hydro, so you didn't get a good seal to some areas that were uh, somewhat wet um, in, the, in those areas where it came in that the harvest was a little bit later. So, again, it depends on what part of the country you're in um, is, is more the story of, of uh, each individual, I guess, state has their issues. Um, but it wasn't that the perfect fall that, you know, uh, the guy can get and then get a lot of the nitrogen put on, so. Great, thank you for that update. Um, is there any other questions out there uh, in the realm for Lanny? Je uh, Jeremy, do you have any questions for Lanny before we wrap? Yeah, I do have a question. Um, Lanny, on the uh, PACT, PA bill, um, could you maybe name a couple pesticides that are either um, banned or suspended in the EU, for, for an example? Um, yeah, that's always a, a good question. Honestly, I can't. Um, you know, I could probably look up a few of them and, 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 and put that out or give it to Nick and put it out there for the next newsletter or something, just so we kind of forewarn, um, you know, what is in Canada and what is in EU. Um, I know there's quite a bit of difference on when it comes to the technology part of it and uh, in the EU. And so um, I know the neonics, those type of things are pretty much already gone over there. Um, so I can, I can try to do a little research on that one just to kind of give us some basis there of what we're looking at and maybe coming down the pike. Okay. Yeah, and if I can just make a comment, um, through U.S. Grains, I learned a lot from one of their staff members, Floyd Gabler, and, who is an expert on biotechnology, and he always complained about how slow to react and move the uh, EU pesticide application and approval process was. He just felt like it wasn't science-based. Um, there was a lot of uh, NGO input that perhaps, you know, had ulterior motives rather than just looking at the science of these um, pesticides and whatever they were. And then um, also at U.S. Grains, we had a uh, speaker by the name of Jack Bobo who talked about the EU's farm to fork um, policy that they have going on right now and just s said that, you know, you can export your, um, your ideas in these, uh, export your sustainability, um, you know, sacrifice local sustainability for global sustainability and that if um, farm to fork was enacted throughout other parts of the world many more people would go to go to bed hungry at night so just you know it's concerning to see um, legislation like this go forward it, it wonders it makes you wonder what the 
you know, safety is one thing, but also, you know, keeping people fed is another. So, yeah, and I agree with you. I think that part of letting the EU and Canada come in, I think that the, you know, they're, I mean, even though we're under the thumb of the EPA, um, they're a lot more over those. Essentially, we're going to let other countries determine what we can do here. And that's just, uh, yeah, that's a scary thought, um, especially with the amount of uh, food that we produce for, for the world and, and uh, putting us under the same criteria of that in the practices of the population is it's a whole different ball game and that's probably one of the scariest things in that bill there is if we go with that essentially we're going to have a worldwide epa and and that's uh that should be a concern for everybody yeah all right well thank you so much for that great update lanny and the, answering those questions um give it a few more seconds and we'll close this poll out And here are the results. And yes, 85% of the corn in Colorado is consumed by livestock. They are by far and wide our largest consumer of corn in this state. And so uh, that is why we work so closely with that industry is because they are our biggest customer. 